Good evening. If you would, pull out your songbooks and turn to number 569. Uh, the first two songs I picked out, I didn't realize, aren't, on our, uh, aren't in our paperless hymnal. So number 569, Sweeter Than All, will be our first song, after which we'll be led in our uh, opening prayer. Christ will me his aid afford, never to fall, never to fall, while I find my precious Lord, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Jesus is now and ever will be, sweeter than all the world to me, since I heard his loving call, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. I can follow all the way, hearing him call, hearing him call, finding him from day to day, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Jesus is now and ever will be, sweeter than all the world to me, since I heard his loving call, sweeter than all, sweeter than all. When I reach the crystal sea, voices will call, voices will call, but my Savior's voice will be sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Jesus is now and ever will be sweeter than all the world to me since I heard his loving call. Sweeter than all, sweeter than all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, it is so grateful to be here and to be in the presence of all the, of these like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ. And Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come together this evening that we will do all things in accordance with thy will, that we will bring our, our worship unto you and it will be pleasing in thy sight. Heavenly Father, there are those who are sick and hurting. There are those who of this very number who are suffering from sickness and sickness of their loved ones. And Heavenly Father, we, we can encourage them and we can support them, but nobody can comfort them like you can. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with each and every one of them. May they lean upon your breast as they go through these trying times. Heavenly Father, we have those who have lost loved ones and are dealing with that loss, and it's, it's hard. Heavenly Father, we, we know that you will take care of them, but it's hard to be separated from them, and we miss them, and, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll comfort them. Heavenly Father, we have those in this congregation who have walked away. They have walked away from you. They're seemingly out of our reach. But you know, Heavenly Father, that you can intervene in their life. You can use somebody here in this very audience to turn them around. 
and then call back upon the most precious name in Jesus and he will forgive them. They can get right back on that same path they've always been on and have that same hope that they've always had in you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the ones that come in our lives, that we see it, we ask for the courage to step up to the plate and reach out to them like their souls depend upon it, because it surely does. Heavenly Father, we pray that you continue to be with PJ and Mike and others as they help lead us in this worship service this evening. May it be encouraging to each and every one here this day. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our song before the lesson will be number 41. Number 41. Again, this one won't be on the screen. 41. Mighty is our God. <clears throat> Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, He's ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord. He's ruler of everything, his name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for he has created everything. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord. He's ruler of everything. Glory to our God. Glory to our King. Glory to our God. He's ruler of everything. Ruler of everything. Ruler of everything. I took a little survey of the supper tonight just to see what uh, we can look forward to. Lots of chili to choose from and also other foods if, you, if chili's not your thing. And I've got my eye on a cherry pie back there. So I hope everybody stays and enjoys this chili cook-off. Even if you didn't bring something, there is plenty for all and everybody's welcome to stay. Coach Mike Shusevsky, can anybody spell Shusevsky? Can anybody tell me how to really pronounce it? Coach Krzyzewski will begin his uh, farewell coaching tour very soon this season. And sometime back when he was talking about in an interview some of the secrets to his success as a basketball coach at Duke University, he said one of the things or one of the reasons why we've been successful is because of the way we treat our players. He said we treat all our players fairly, but we do not treat them all the same. They're all equal in worth and value as human beings, but they're not the same, and we don't treat them like they are the same. He said, here's one example. If the team bus is ready to depart for a game, and one of the players is missing, it depends on who that player is as to whether we're going to wait for him. If he's a freshman, he's missed the bus. We're leaving. But if he's a senior who's been here for years... And he has spent years building rapport and trust with the team. We're going to wait on that senior. He has earned that. In a similar way, in the Lord's church, everyone is equal in dignity and worth. As human souls created in the image of God, we're all equal in that we have equal access to salvation in Jesus Christ. We're all equal in that we have an equal hope of heaven as faithful Christians and get to enjoy all the treasures of heaven that everybody else in heaven enjoys or will enjoy. We are all equal and one in Christ in that regard, but we are not all the same. 
We have different identities. There are various things that distinguish us from one another. And we have been assigned different roles and tasks and responsibilities. We are equal, but not the same. Now, please don't mistake this lesson. It is not intended in any way to detract from this morning's lesson. This morning's sermon stands on its own merit. And so let me uh, re-emphasize some of that from this morning. In James chapter 2, we read and studied about the sin of partiality. It is wrong for us to be prejudiced against some people and to be, um, uh, show favoritism toward other people. That is a sin, according to James chapter 2. And we all need to be careful about being guilty about showing favoritism. Let me encourage all of us to avoid getting into our little cliques and getting too comfortable with our circle of family, our friends. We need to challenge ourselves to get outside of our clique, to mingle with everybody in the church, to show our love for everybody, to get fully involved in the life of the congregation and to act like the loving, inclusive church family that God has called us to be. We all need to challenge ourselves to do that. Don't show favorites in the church. God wants His people today to be impartial because He is impartial. Peter said it in Acts 10.34 and 1 Peter 1.17, there is no respecter or that God is no respecter of persons That's the way the King James says it. In other words, God doesn't show partiality. Paul said it three different times. Galatians uh, 2.6, Romans 2.11, Ephesians 6.9, with God there is no partiality or favoritism. And our key verse tonight is Galatians 3.28. Paul says there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus. We need to understand that in Paul's day and age, there were things that distinguished people in culture, in society. Don't think of the culture of the Greco-Roman world of the first century as being monolithic. It was not monolithic. Our culture in America is not monolithic, is it? There is a diversity of cultures in our country. And it was like that back during the Greco-Roman world of the first century when the New Testament was written. You had the Jewish culture, which was very, very different from the Greek culture and the Roman culture. And in addition to Jewish culture, you had the Greco-Roman pagan culture as well. So Paul is is noticing some of those distinctions in Galatians 3.28. For example, Jewish men when they prayed certain liturgical prayers, regularly they would include in their prayers, thank you God for not making me a Gentile, and thank you God for not making me a woman. That's the way the Jews were. Uh, They looked down upon women. Women were sort of second-class citizens in the Jewish world. It was a little different from that, and quite very different with the Greco-Roman world, But in the Roman Empire, there were more slaves than there were freedmen. That's because Rome had been so imperialistic. They had conquered all these other nations and then brought those conquered people back to Rome and used them as slaves. And Rome of the first century lived in constant fear of the slaves getting organized, and educated, because if they ever got organized and educated, there were so many more of them that they could rise up and overthrow the empire. And so they were very oppressive to their slaves to keep them down to try to prevent something like that from happening. So Paul is saying in that culture, in that world, when we come into Jesus Christ, we're not going to be have different levels of value or different levels of importance like out there in the Jewish world and out there in the Greco-Roman world. In the body of Christ, we're going to be one. We're going to be equal. But he did not mean that we're all the same. We know that from the immediate context of Galatians 3.28. We know that from the context of Paul's other writings, 
when we examine the entire Pauline corpus. We also know it when we examine the rest of the New Testament and the Bible. When we look at this verse in all of its context, and its concentric circles of context emanating out from it, we know that Paul did not mean that we lose all distinction in Christ Jesus. When we get baptized, we don't lose our gender. We still have gender. Gender is very important. In the beginning, when God made humanity, He made humanity male and female. And folks are confused about that in today's world. But God's Word stands. God makes people male and female. And in the animal world, we see the importance of that. Folks, if you buy a rooster expecting eggs, or you buy a bull expecting milk, you're going to be sorely disappointed. God created humans, male and female. And we don't lose that distinction in Jesus Christ. When we get baptized into Christ, we don't lose our ethnicity. We still are ethnically what we were before we came into the body of Christ. And we don't lose our, our change, our socioeconomic status when we come into the body of Christ either. There are so many things that help determine our socioeconomic status in our culture and in our world. Things like opportunities and blessings. Not everybody has the same opportunities and blessings. Not everybody has the same intelligence. Not everybody has the same talents and abilities. Not everybody has the same desire. Have you tried to order food at a fast food restaurant lately with the shortage of workers? Not everybody has the same work ethic. I'm hearing there's a big shortage around here of, of school bus drivers. Not everybody it wants to do that kind of job. Some people don't want to do any kind of job. People have different levels of desires and different levels of work ethic. That's what determines socioeconomic status. Nowhere in Scripture is it mandated that we must ensure equal economic outcomes regardless of ability and desire and work ethic. I find it very interesting when Jesus tells the parable of the talents and talents are, are not abilities, talents. They're, and they're not coins either. They're weights. Talents are weights where you put the weights on one side of the scale to measure out money or gold or silver on the other side of the scale. So talents are measurements or weights of money. And it's interesting that in Jesus' story, the master divides up his talents among three different servants according to their ability. He gives one man five talents because evidently he's got more ability than the others. He gives one man two talents. He gives one man one talent. And they're not criticized because they have different abilities, but he divvies out his money according to their ability. He goes on a trip and he comes back and calls for an accounting. And the five talent man has, has turned it into ten. And the two-talent man has turned his into four. But the one-talent man was afraid and he hid his money and he didn't invest it or do anything with it. So all he's got is just that one talent left. And that man is condemned by the master and his talent is given to the five-talent man. And the five-talent man and the two-talent man in the story get the same blessings, the same promises, the same rewards identically. I find it very interesting that in the church at Thessalonica, there were Christians who were so convinced of the imminent return of the Lord that they quit work and were just sitting around waiting for the Lord to come back. If the Lord's going to come back any day now, why go to work? Let's just wait for the Lord to come back. And as the Lord's coming was tarried, they ran out of money. And then they started running out of food. And they expected the church to feed them. And Paul said, don't you feed them. Don't enable them. Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. He wasn't talking about people that couldn't work. He was talking about people that could work, but refused to work. And Paul said, you don't let people mooch off the church. If you don't work, you don't eat. And so socioeconomic status doesn't change just because we get baptized into Jesus Christ. We don't lose our distinctions, but what it means is that we're all one. We're all equal in Jesus. Regardless of our distinctions in Christ, we are one. 
Incidentally, we need to take just a moment to notice the verse right before our text tonight. Verse 27. How do we get into Christ? Paul says, For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What do we get in Christ? Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, All spiritual blessings are in Christ. So that's where our equality is. Our equality is, is not in gender and socioeconomic status or any of these other things. Our equality is that we get all the same spiritual blessings. We're all one in, in value and worth. There used to be a, a wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles under the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, in the New Testament age, that wall of separation has been torn down by Christ. And so Jews and Gentiles, males and females, Romans and barbarians, slaves and free, can all be in the same body now without any wall of separation between them. If you want all the spiritual blessings in Christ, get into Christ. And there's only one way into Christ. And that's to get baptized into Jesus Christ. Folks, we have to make judgments. We have to make judgment calls. We have to make distinctions. We have to discriminate. We must. We're called upon to do so throughout Scripture. Let me give you just a few examples. I understand we looked at James 2 verse 4 this morning, but it doesn't warn against making any and all distinctions. It warns against making distinctions as judges with evil thoughts. That's the kind of discrimination that is condemned. I know Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. But Jesus' note is talking about the kind of judgment that's wrong is not any and all judgment, but the kind of judgment that you dish out that you don't expect to get back. That's wrong kind of judgment. And he goes on to explain further in verses 3 through 5. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye, and look, there's a plank in your own eye. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is not condemning any and all judgment. He's condemning hypercritical and hypocritical judgment. Later in that same chapter, staying in Matthew chapter 7, he says in verses 15 and 16, beware of false prophets. How can you do that if you don't distinguish between people? If you don't discriminate between truth teachers and false teachers, how can you beware of false teachers? In verse 16 of Matthew 7, he says you'll recognize them by their fruits. No, we're not supposed to be hypocritical judges, but we are supposed to be fruit inspectors. There is a difference. We have to make distinctions. Jesus said it another way, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We must discriminate on spiritual grounds, but not on carnal grounds. In Proverbs 22, 24, the Bible says, make no friendship with a man given to anger. Well, if I'm not supposed to get too buddy-buddy with a, with a high-tempered man, how, how can I distinguish who's a high-tempered man from one who isn't unless I make a judgment? And in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good morals. And in that context, the evil communications is false teachings. So how can I avoid false teachings that will corrupt my good morals if I don't make judgments, if I don't discriminate between those who treat, teach the truth? and those who teach that which is not truth. And in 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now in the first place, not everybody can be an elder. Elders are specially chosen men who have met certain qualifications and have been duly appointed to lead the local congregation. Deacons are a special group of people. Not every man can be a deacon, a special ministering servant under the oversight of the elders. We make distinctions. Elders, deacons from 
the members of the congregation. And then among elders, some might be worthy of double honor. That's a distinction you have to make as well. And we could go on all night and we won't, but we could, showing verse after verse after verse where we have to make judgments, we have to make distinctions. What Paul meant was not that we lose our ethnicity or our gender or our socioeconomic status by coming into the body of Christ. What he meant is we all have equal access to spiritual blessings in Christ, regardless of what our ethnicity is or our socioeconomic status or our gender, but there are distinctions to be made. We are equal in the church, but we are not the same. Some years ago, I, there's a friend of mine who's an elder in, in a congregation in Corinth, Mississippi. His son was a starter on the Corinth high school basketball team, the Corinth Warriors, and they won the state championship. And I didn't get to see them play, so I asked him, it was John Dodd, and I asked him about his son and, and uh, how he enjoyed playing on that team. And I remember John saying, well, he, he was a role player on the team. And what his dad meant was, as a role player, is he was not a scorer. That was not his job. It was his job to help get the ball up and down the court, to facilitate the ball around, to pass it around, and to play defense. That was his role. And he accepted that valuable role on that state championship team. And I have no doubt but that if he had resented that, if he had felt unequal or mistreated or been done unfairly, and there had been contention over it, I have no doubt but what they would have failed to have won the state championship. They were a championship team because everybody on the team had their role and knew their role and did their role as an equally valuable member of the team and yet different and not the same. There is wisdom in that to be applied even in the church. In Christ, we're all one, equal in the sense of value and all get the same reward in heaven and yet not the same. Both lessons today go perfectly together like hand in glove. Now we're going to take a little Bible bowl quiz in a little bit on Romans chapter 6. So here are four verses to help you out with that. Do you not Paul know, Paul asked, do you not know that as many of us as have been baptized into Christ, there it is again, Paul is consistent in how to get into Christ and all of his teachings. That as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized, that word baptizo means immersed, submerged in water. Were baptized into His death. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Will any of the questions come from these verses tonight? Yes, all right. I haven't seen the test. I don't know. Two more. For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. What's Paul saying? The Gospel enacted is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And baptism, our baptism, is the gospel reenacted. We reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in our baptism. When you get baptized, you bury that old self in a watery grave. And you come up out of that burial. You died to sin. You buried that old person in the watery grave. And you come up. You're raised. You're resurrected to walk a new life in Jesus Christ. You get baptized into Christ by dying, being buried, and resurrected. Just like Christ died, was buried, and resurrected. So baptism is not just some outward sign of some inward reality. 
Baptism is the reality and is the means, the mode by which Paul consistently teaches by which we get into Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be in Christ? Don't you want all those spiritual blessings in heavenly places that are only available into Christ? Come forward tonight and we'll baptize you into Christ. If you need the prayers of your church family, we invite you to come forward as well. Our fellows are putting up the song in the back. PJ's going to lead it for us. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come. Oh, do not let the word depart and close thine eyes against the light. For sin or not thy heart. Be saved, go tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Then why not tonight? Our blessed Lord refuses none who would to Him their souls unite. Believe, obey, the work is done. Be saved all tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Then why not tonight? Uh, if there's, is there anyone here this evening that was un unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning and needs to do so? If you would, uh, at this time, if you can meet Danny in the back, uh, he will uh, uh, provide that in one of the classrooms. So just meet Brother Danny in the foyer. Uh, our closing song is going to be, uh, if I turn the page, uh, I Exalt Thee. Uh, if you would like to, let's stand for our closing song and for the closing prayer to follow. <clears throat> For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this opportunity that we've been able to gather here this evening and worship you and to study your word, Lord. And we just pray that you will be again with, again be with those who are mentioned on our prayer list. Lord, we pray that you'll heal and comfort and give peace to those who suffer. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we're about to have. And as we go back and we fellowship and we break bread together, Lord, and we, we, we visit 
and we edify and encourage each other, Lord. And I pray that you will bless that food to the nourish of our bodies and our bodies to your service. And Lord, we're so thankful for you sending your son to die on that cross to give us as sinners an opportunity to live with you in heaven forever. And it's through his holy name we pray. Amen.